So Candace, I am thrilled for this opportunity to talk to you one-on-one. -on -one. I rarely get that. <laughs> <laughs> Me too, I'm excited. Yeah, so you are just moving up into our circle of licensed coaches that we call the inner circle inside the anti-boring educators world. But even though that's happening right now in May 2022, you have, I think you are one of the people with the longest history <laughs> Ever. of following me. And so Ever. we say a little bit about when it was you joined my world and what made you come into the anti-boring land? I found you. I, I, re I remember this like the back of my hand, right? Because I feel like I also have shared this with you. And when other people come in, like I'm probably the poster child of <laughs> take your time, mess up, do it over. But I, I found you in 2014 when my niece, who is now, but I mean, then what she was like 17, 18, and she's now 26. Uh, she was, yes, right? So I found you because I was looking for scholarships for her as she was preparing. She was in her senior year of high school, preparing for college. And I came across, and I can't remember this young woman's uh, name, but she was doing, I, I was already on her mailing list for scholarships. And she was doing an interview with an academic coach. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that's how I remember that interview. <laughs> yep, that was the first time I saw you. So when I saw an academic coach, I was just like, why it piqued my interest so much is because, um, I, you know, I didn't want to be a teacher because I went to school for accounting, right? I like numbers and concepts and things like that. But I had an approach to how my children were learning and the habits I was building in them that everyone always took notice to it. Like their after school programs were like, well, always say things like, you know, we went to the library today. Your kids were the only kids who knew how to use it. It's like a pedia. They were the only ones who knew how to use a dictionary effectively because I taught them all these little things. Um, so when I saw an academic coach, I was just like, why does that feel like I should really, really watch this interview? I watched the interview and I was just like, mm -mm. that's exactly what I do. This is what I do. I had never saw the title before. I had never seen one before, but it was like the first time I saw myself. And then I remember at that time I sent it to my husband and he was like, oh my gosh, that's you right? Because that's how I was with the, with my kids. And even when I met him, you know, it, it, and I, he saw the way I would do stuff with the kids and things like that. He was always like, you know, you're really organized and things like that. So it was the first time I had even saw what an academic coach was. And then I started looking on your website, right? Always looking at your stuff. And then I emailed you and said, do you train people to become academic coaches? And then you let me know that you were already, a lot of people have already inquired, you were already on that road to kind of building something. So I'm literally probably one of the first people to come in um, and never finish and then start again and stuff like that. But that's how I found you and um, how we first connected. Yeah, and we had several phone calls, like a, a year or two would go by enough. I would sit here, nothing from you. And then you would. <laughs> yep, yep. And then you would duck in and slowly You've taken the art of inspiring students and right. launched your biz. And now you've been officially in the actual Rocker Biz training program and now moving up to the licensed coaches for the last little over a year. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about the business that you're trying to create because it's a little, you've got your own special Candace twist mm -hmm. on uh, how you're working with students. So tell us a little bit. So my business has the academic coaching concept as well as college planning for families, right? Because that was actually what I was doing. So what I noticed, even for my niece and family members, when I would kind of work with them, I was a first generation graduate, right? So there was no blueprint for me. Nobody knew what they were doing. I was just really ambitious. Um, and my dad would always say, you know, I didn't have no money to give you. Me and your mother didn't have any money. We didn't have any degree we didn't have any training we didn't have nothing to give you but encouragement so when I even made my business it's called be encouraged uh LLC right and that's where that came from because he said we didn't have anything he said you well he said Kendra you always had an idea you were always like the one that just kind of like there was nobody in my neighborhood talking about going to college but at the time there was a show called a different world which was a spinoff of the Cosby show and my sister went to Howard homecoming 
so I just was like, oh, Hillman is Howard. Oh, that's what it is. Right. Is so for me, older than you too. Yes. My oldest okay. sister. Right. So I had two oldest sisters, yeah. the oldest one, which was like, we have an eight year gap. Oh, wow. So you really did. I mean, I was, I'm of the generation of a different world as well. And so you were watching that while she was going through college. No, yeah. she didn't go to college. She just went to homecoming. <laughs> That's it. Like she did, she, and that's the thing. No one ever went to college, but one year she went to Howard Homecoming, and her and her friends were in the living room talking about it. And I'm the little sister. I'm always in everyone's business, right? I'm the baby. I'm in everybody's business when someone's over. So I'm in the living room, like listening to all the stories. And this one got robbed, and this person performed at the concert, and they bought me back a shirt. And it had all the HBCUs, which are historically black colleges and universities all over them. And I was learning about HBCUs on a different world, right? So I was, I mean, it's almost a level of, of it made a bit even become an obsession to me. And we didn't have Google and stuff like that. So I literally, um, I think, oh no, I think is what I, my bishop at the time at the church I was attending, he was actually Bill Cosby's cousin whoa exactly right and he also had like a really popular radio show our church um in the 90s was really popular and my parents told them you know went to him and told them how much I was talking about college and he was a big advocate of that so if you went upstairs to like where he lived like he lived over top of the church and he just had all these pictures and all these books and stuff and he really just poured that into me too and supported me so I, I was able, and I was in the sixth grade. So from the sixth grade, I kept saying, I'm going to go to Howard because that was my Hillman. And I really wanted to go to Hillman, right? So that's where uh, the whole college thing came from. And then once I did get to college, a lot of stuff happened. Two weeks after I get to school, my house catches on fire. Burns, yes. My whole family in the house, I'm at school. Two weeks, I just got there. And first of all, I got there on a prayer because we didn't have any money. You know, and my dad uh, always talks about it. He said, everyone said, you're crazy. Do not send her away to school. You guys are broke, broke. I grew up in South Jamaica, Queens, New York. So they're like, you guys don't have money. How are you going to let her go to school? And my dad actually tried to get me to go to Temple and the University of Albany because they actually gave me scholarships and Howard did not. But, but we all knew. It was like the neighborhood knows. My school knows. Everyone knew the deal since sixth grade. It's Howard or no. I'm only applying to these other schools because y'all made me. Okay, right. <laughs> like right. But Howard is where that is my my uh, destiny. <laughs> right, and it was like, and they, everyone knew. Like I, it was embedded in everything. And my dad actually said that he had to pray about it, and he said he remember just hearing God say, uh, "Move out of her way," and he said. Also, he felt like he said it was like a question that came to him that was like, if she went to Temple, is that comfortable? Is that because it makes you more comfortable? Mm -hmm. But would it make her miserable? Mm -hmm. And my dad was like, then after that, he said, he, I gave a speech. I had to give a speech or something in church speaking about like what I was about to do and stuff like that. And then it was a scripture, Philippians 4.13. I said, like, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. And my father was like, that was almost like the it just hit him so hard. Like I, I can't stop her. Like if I send her there, she'd probably figure out a way to get out. Right. Like he's like, I can't stop her. So, mm -hmm. you know, we got there again. So my house catches on fire. On, okay, before you tell more about that, I just want yeah. to pinpoint for the listeners. Um, we're going to come back to the theme of parents needing to get out of the way. Yes. So move that you were on the precipice of being the recipient of a parent who almost didn't get out of the way for you. Yes. Yeah. Anyway, we'll come back to that in just a moment when we talk about- Because that's such a parent. good point. We, we can really, yeah, that's so good. Mm -hmm. and, my, and I actually interviewed my dad and he brought that up because um, it, was, it was a big deal. So yes, yeah, so my house catches on fire two weeks after I get to school. My family, thank God, got out safely, but everything, we lost everything. And, and then I'm thinking, I did mess up. I got to go home. Like I shouldn't have never been here. Um, and then my mom, actually my house catches fire on fire on a Wednesday. That Saturday, my family was scheduled to come because I had things that they were still bringing because I couldn't bring them all the first time. That stuff obviously got burnt up. My computer, I had a brand new computer, a fridge, you know, the mini fridge. 
all that stuff that family had got for me. My family still came down that Saturday. My aunt gives me the computer off her desk. They wow. find a way to, yeah, someone else gives me a mini fridge to replace it. And my family came down there and the clothes that was given to them from the Salvation Army. And they went back home after that weekend. They said, my mother said, you're staying. And my first year of college, when I went home on the weekend, I went home to a shelter in the Bronx. Wow. Until, and then at my, at the end of that year, we actually did move into our first home. Um, but then my sophomore year, I got pregnant. Right now I'm a teen mom. <laughs> And it wow. was, I told, I'm, I have not heard this part of your story. So it's like, I know we're going to get to what's your business looking like now. And what was it like to grow the business? And what's it like being an accountant full-time while you're building your business? So but this part stay, is important. Yeah, good. So stay tuned, everybody listening. Like, we'll, we'll hear this first. <laughs> this part is really important because it, it really is the foundation and it's going to make so much more sense as you see why I do what I do and how we built that business. And I had no idea. Yeah. And I think that my dad says it all the time. He said, I can see now everything mm. and why God said, move out of her way. Right. So I become a team mom. I try to come home and um, tell my mom, like, you know, I actually kept it from them for a number of months, which was easy to do. I was skinny. I wore big clothes. I was embarrassed. I was also ashamed because I am the, I'm like, you know, I was on a pedestal. A lot of people did put me on a pedestal because I was that kid, right? Doing all the things, making it out of the hood and doing so well and being the first to go to college. I really was so ashamed of myself that I kept it from my family. And when they found out, my mother said, I was like, I'm just going to take off the rest of the semester, have the baby because he was doing February spring semester. And I was like, I'll go back to school. She was like, absolutely not. You're going to, I was home on like Christmas break. She said, get yourself together, go back to school and figure it out. And I actually went to my professors and, and it was the first time I did remote learning because I had to make a deal with each professor and the department to let me come home, have my baby, do work while I was home. And literally I was only home for three weeks and I had to leave him and come back and finish the semester. And then after that summer, he, he came back to live on campus with me for my last two years. Now, why that's important is because since I stepped on Howard's campus, everyone kept trying to figure out how was I still there? Right. And I got a job in financial aid. <laughs> oh, wow. Wow. My last two years. I mean, when I filed the paper, I went into the filing room with a post-it and a pen because when I was filing people's award letters, I was writing down the scholarships they had because I wanted to figure out how they were there. I found out so much information working in financial aid. It was, I mean, I was friends with everybody <laughs> in financial aid. I like, I just really, really soaked up everything in there. Um, I found out about endowment funds, all these things. Like even when I found something out, it was like rotary phones. I called my friends like, y'all need to come down here to financial aid today because you can uh, apply for an endowment scholarship. And that year we all got scholarships. And when I left school, it was just like a magnet. People were just coming to me like, how did you do it? How did you do it? So for years, I was helping people giving them all the information I knew until a, a day I find out about an academic coach. And that whole thing started to come together. But the coaching, what I noticed is that a lot of the students I was helping didn't have certain skills that I was teaching my kids to prepare them to be better students in high school so that the college process would be easier. And that's how I started trying to bring the two together when I found like, okay, I love college planning, but I also see what I'm doing with my kids and then I'm like, wait a minute, the two go together. And that's what really brought it about when I was trying to, and that's why for years, even when I met you, I didn't really know how to do both. I was always trying to figure, I thought I was going to have to let one go or do it separately. So it took me some time to really figure out how I was going to do both and do it in a way that was going to actually be profitable. And so you're still working full-time as an accountant for right now, though you and I have had a number of discussions where I'm <laughs> pushing you, but I know taking care of your family is very important. Um, but what are you learning about uh, both how to pull, pull those two sides, the college planning and the academic coaching together? What are you learning about that? And what are you learning about uh, how to do all that while you're keeping a family going and working a full-time job oh my gosh I felt like it was so 
in the beginning, I, I did, of course, I, did, I didn't know what I was doing, right? Right. And then it was like the more, and I wasn't even doing your program once I even, when I signed up, it wasn't perfect because I also still had fear. Mm -hmm. um, like the whole like reaching out to people for referrals, stuff like that. I was like, oh gosh, like, I don't know, all the fears will come up, imposter syndrome. I mean, I dealt with all that stuff. That's why I was just quick. Mm -hmm. I was just, I, would, I could make a great excuse to why I had to quit because I got three kids and I'm too busy. Mm -hmm. Right. And then what I what I was seeing, though, once I really started paying attention and really giving myself the time to say, you know, even if I do this slow. I'm gonna get it done. And what I noticed is that the students that I was working with and this was some of them, what this was when I'm not making money, I'm just doing this because I want to do it. Mm -hmm. And I've worked and I can see it even now. Right. Like with my son, I just noticed that with my oldest son, there were certain things that he would he was able to become very strong in, right? Like I also knew their personalities and my son, my oldest son has a, like a kind of quirky personality is very, he's very black and white. Like me and him are like 180 of each other. So total opposites, right? So I'm like turned up all the time. Like, ah, he's kind of like, yeah. And then I also knew when I also paid attention to how certain teachers received him. Some didn't get him, but the ones that did, he just excelled in those classes. So what I noticed that I was giving him certain, like there was a, we had a study routine. I understood how he studied. And that's something that you really enlightened me. And I was like, oh my gosh, I knew I wasn't crazy. Everybody cannot study the same. Everyone does not learn the same. And once I saw that he was doing those things, when he got to high school, he had his challenges, but there were certain things embedded in him and certain habits that made certain things easier. Because when he got to college, you know, his first semester, he got a 4.0. Right. I remember. It's so funny. I remember you celebrating that so much. <laughs> yeah, because and it didn't feel like he still, again, had his challenges because I remember midterms, he had like two B's, three B's in a C. Mm -hmm. And all I said was like, OK, what do we need to do? Right. Revisit. Let's do these things. And then again, the things work, mm -hmm. even for my niece. My niece is like one of the first test subjects. And she because my sister, she was in middle school when my sister passed away. And it was very hard on her. So high school was tough. She was not her best. So she almost got into college like on a whim mm -hmm. through like a bridge program. Mm -hmm. Her first two years rough, but once she, it clicked for her and she really started to implement what I was saying to her, she turned around and ended out on the Dean's list twice. Mm -hmm. You see what I'm saying? So I'm seeing not only just the, I was able to see the coaching, but then after her, I was able to see a lot of mistakes that we made. And I was like, had she did this here, when she was choosing schools, we could have positioned her better for money. We could have positioned her for a school that was more of her fit. She wound up loving her school, but in the beginning, she thought she was going to, she wanted to like transfer every, every semester. Mm -hmm. Right. But I just noticed certain things. And each time I did it, I saw the correlation and I was like, for the students I would meet later on. And I'll just notice they weren't organized. They didn't know how to study. And I was like, well, well college is going to take you out. And I then I started. Literally yeah, take you out. It's yeah, going like to take you college. out. You won't pack it. Exactly. And mm -hmm. then I saw how students were. And then also, because even now in my program, I'm, I'm working on something for fall for to mentor a mentorship, like monthly mentorship program for the undergrad, because they still need you. They need, they need the things that no one tells them about the importance of a syllabus and how to take that syllabus and take those dates and put it on a calendar and how to manage those assignments straight from your syllabus, right? Like things that they never tell you that some, I, I, I meet students who are juniors and they've never done it, mm -hmm. right? So I started to really see how I couldn't do one, I had to do both and how they kind of mesh with each other because the academic coaching set them up in high school to position them better for opportunities, especially coming from me, coming from a neighborhood where it was not seen, where we do not have that money, where people do not even know or understand or even see. They just assume I should be at a state school, not knowing that you can go to a very expensive school as long as it's generous to you and they're going to give you a great package. Mm -hmm. Right. So also being able to educate them about that ahead of time so they can position themselves for those opportunities. Yeah, and I can really see the power of being a college um, mentor, counselor, person who understands a student's learning. And not just learning, but who has seen a student move from whatever their real challenge point is 
to a success because there's so much you can learn about how a student handles adversity and their resilience mm. by supporting them in the academic coaching realm and and then how that could support thinking about what colleges they might be good at absolutely yeah so do you, like the, the standard model of coaching that I teach is a one-to-one -one model, kind of like a tutoring session once a week. I know that's not exactly how you work though. So will you just say a little bit in case people are listening and thinking like, oh my goodness, Candace's approach sounds great for myself, for my kid. Can you help us imagine a little bit about if someone were to work with you, what it looks like? Okay. So what I was doing when I was trying stuff out, I had clients that were just academic coaching. Mm -hmm. They just needed that because actually my first really like, um, well, I'm going to say my first when I actually started the business and, you know, made it official, official, my first academic coaching client was a college student who was a, a sophomore at the time, right? So he's already in college. Um, so I was taking clients who were just academic coaching and then I was doing the, the college planning. Um, and again, but they were all one-on-one, -on -one, right? Until I saw that, wait a minute. And I had to see this, right? By trial and error that something will have to change because there's so many clients and yes, I still have a nine to five, but even if I didn't have a nine to five kids are in school during the day, regardless. Right. So it would still be my evenings and it would still take up the time. Right. So what I saw was that the, something will have to change. And now like what's happening right now is actually, I just was working with someone and we came up with a great idea is how to make the college part, um, a group coaching, because I am essentially saying the same thing over and over again. Right. right. Um, but even like me and you spoke about is also having the option to work with me one on one. And we have now also kind of and I'm trying this out to do like maybe a six week group coaching for the college planning. Right. And after that, you can now come into a min monthly mentorship. Right. Right. Where you still get where now you get to, you've done the work. Mm -hmm. you've done that work and now I can mentor you through your questions and things like that so that I can access more students right. um and then also as I develop this program it's going to be something that I'm going to actually you know go to schools with mm -hmm. right to do workshops and things like that so right now the one-on-one -on -one, it works but you can only do but so many I mean right 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 and so I mean it's just so interesting the trajectories that people go through uh, some people quit their job completely, do my training program, put all their time into it, fill up with one-to-one -one clients, feel what that's like, and then decide if they want to just keep on raising their prices at that, or if they want to move into group coaching. You, because you've taken almost a decade. <laughs> okay. <laughs> one of the beauties of that, I actually think in some ways, your business and my business have moved in the same way because it's taken me a long time to land on the Anti-Boring Educators Club and on the Rock Your Coaching track and the Rock Your Biz track. And it's, it just takes time sometimes to try to iterate, to try a little bit. People ask you for something, you try it, you work it out. Something works, something doesn't, you try another little one yeah. and, and slowly over time tweak into what it needs to look like that's not everybody's pathway but it seems to be your pathway and it was definitely my pathway yeah absolutely and it was just like after being able to see me actually do it so consistently over like last school year like during COVID it was a little bit then 2021 mm -hmm. it got more than we hit like the end of 2021 and it was just like okay, I have to figure something out because yeah. now it's just I can't use all my evening time in that way. And it, of course, it's just going to overwhelm me and then I'm not going to want to do it, which right. I, and I love to do it. So I had to figure out a way to not also, I didn't also didn't want to make it evergreen. Um, the program, I needed some kind of contact because that's where I thrive is one-to-one -one because I, I can get students, right? I'm that person that kind of can see who they are too outside of grades and things like that. And I can look at a student, like I have a student now and she's, you know, She's a sophomore, but she wants to go to a small school. She wants it to be faith-based and she really wants to study architecture, but she wants to figure out how to minor in education. And we just started, and she's actually going to study abroad for her junior year. Mm -hmm. So she has like all these different things to her. And I finally kind of figured her out, right? Which you don't get someone to really take the time to do instead of like a, and nothing against guidance or school counselors, but I know that you may not have the time to really sit with her. 
mm-hmm. to really get her to figure out where, where her niche is and what she really wants to do with it. And we just kind of figured that out. And she's so excited. She was like, I am so mm-hmm. excited because I gave her another tool to use when she's looking at schools. And she started, I had her um, emailing department chairs at colleges and she got responses. And she was like, wow, see, you're right. That's what we, we, Megan and I would say on the College Prep Podcast, like y'all, young people, use your youth. If you reach out directly to adults, we are not used to this and our hearts will like glow and want to support you. What a beautiful thing to suggest to her and to have her actually follow through with. I mean, there was a school, I said, I want you to pay attention to how the school responded to you because this lets you know that they were so eager to give you information. I mean, they gave her examples like you should try looking at this YouTube and this person because they could also give you some inspiration. They didn't give you a blanket answer. Right. They didn't, they right. gave, they did a little research for you. Right. And that's the school you should pay, pay attention to because if they were generous with that information, they may also be generous with your funds. Mm-hmm. Yes. Yes. Oh, so much juice here. And we need to be wrapping up shortly. And there are a few more topics that I want to talk <laughs> about and just bookmark for you and I to talk offline. It suddenly occurred to me, you would be a good per- person to, I need interns. Mm-hmm. and interns who are interested in either education or marketing or whatever but i would like to have every year a small team of college age interns who uh i write really good recommendations i'm a really good mentor they could be serving me i could be serving them and you might have some ideas of how to oh, yeah. write people my way so we'll talk about that <laughs> <laughs> offline um so what is if there are some people watching this video who are considering coming into the Rock Your Biz training, but who have full-time jobs and are gonna have to stay in their full-time job, what would, what's one tip? I know there are probably lots of tips and I know you probably did it wrong as much as you did it right, because that's just the way time management is, but what's one thing you might tell them to consider? I would tell them to consider, because what's gonna probably happen is that you're just gonna feel busy it's going to be very easy to be busy and say, I don't have time to do this. But what I want you to do is just make sure you show up to the community calls. And I think that was the biggest thing for me. Once I started showing up all the time, like I may not been, have been able to go through each you know, lesson, comment as I should, right? Or sometimes I was listening and then had to stop and do something else. But when I showed up to those community calls, it was also the drive that I needed and I would get inspired because I kept hearing what everyone else was doing, right? And guess what? I wasn't the only one struggling. And I think that was so key. It was just like, just hearing what they were doing with students, hearing what they were um, experiencing, hearing the highs, the lows, the joys, the wins, and really st- it's like staying around the fire. That's what it is. Even when your, your nine to five starts to overwhelm you, your life starts life in, right? Get around the fire. So what I, even me, like I, I come to the calls and I can't even speak on the calls because usually I'm at my desk and I just listen in and I might respond in the chat. But what I'm doing is I'm trying to make sure I'm around the fire because the more I stay around that fire, it also motivates me to go back and say, okay, make out your plan because uh, today Misha mentioned this. And I think that's in the lesson. You got to go back and review that. And I might not go through the whole thing, but I'll go right back for that and listen like, this week, Gretchen, I was uh, listening to, uh, I, what was the student? Is her name Olivia? Uh, yeah. I'm Olivia. listening to those, right? Yeah. So I, so I, 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 I want to pause just because yeah. people don't know what you're saying. In, yeah. the, um, in the club, once a month, I post a full unedited session of me coaching a client in my best coaching and my worst coaching. You just see the whole thing. <laughs> and that's what you're talking about. Yes. And it was so good. And, and here's the thing. Again, I understand that I can get overwhelmed by the information. So I took one thing I wanted to work on this week. And it was that. Last week, we have someone who posts, uh, we have other members who do videos and stuff, the executive functions. Oh, good. Yeah. Last week, I focused on that. You see what I mean? And as long as I stay around the fire, I know what's going on. And then I can go back to work on what I can and not feel like I'm overwhelmed or I'm feeling left out. I love it. So stay around the fire. Yeah. And it's not like you're not getting in the fire, right? You get burned if you tried to get in the fire. So Mm -hmm. there's too much. There's so much in my world. When you come in, you just get the fire hose of Gretchen, um, fire hose, different, different analogies, (laughs) but, but yeah, pick the one thing 
that's going to warm your hands pick the yes. fire and be at that edge of the fire. I love it. I love it. Um, great. So let's, I know now this is going to be a really tiny part of the conversation, but one of the reasons I invited you into this call, other than I wanted to celebrate you moving up into the circle of licensed coaches was because we had a fascinating conversation in one of those inner circle calls with a coach who is from Bermuda, a white coach who is living in Bermuda, coaching white and local black Bermudans. And you have your family, your culture comes from that kind of high academic um, island culture. Is that mm -hmm. accurate what I've just yeah, said? Yeah, island culture, yes. Yeah. And so do you remember, I mean, I could summarize it, but it would be more interesting, I think, to hear you. Do you remember what it was like? Well, Candace was in her office, so couldn't talk to us. And so Susanna and I were talking. <laughs> and then I was like, Candace, I don't know if there's any way you can use your voice, but if so. And anyway, you left the office because it felt important enough to speak with us more specifically. And if you could let us know a little bit about what you shared and why you're so passionate about that topic. And now we're going back to this idea of parents getting out of the way. Absolutely, because um, I got, you know, I have, I'm connected to a lot of island and Caribbean culture through my family. Um, and so I'm able, I, was, I grew up in, in different households, right? I have family from Guyana, I have family from St. Thomas in Jamaica. And so I was able to see how those parents parent differently than also black culture and in other cultures as well. And one of the things that is very, very common in um, island culture is that they are, I mean, they are about academics, right? But they also have a, a level of um, intensity and they're very strict, right? So I knew I had friends whose parents may have been Jamaican or something. And they, I mean, half of them, they couldn't come outside when I was outside, right? They couldn't, they had, they had their, study things they had their chores like you better not do this it was and, and they didn't flinch from it right like they didn't divert from it I couldn't convince them to do what I was doing because I had a little bit more freedom but they did not and I also saw the strictness of it, it was almost like you either pass or you don't you're not gonna have no life right and it was just it was a non-negotiable and for a lot of you know when I went to school a lot of the international students honestly is where I, I probably thrive because I had my friends, you know, you had all your different friends, but when it was time for me to study accounting, I got in the group, the study group with the international students because they're, I mean, <laughs> they were about their stuff. Like I was the only person did not, who did not sit for a CPA. Cause I was honestly, I was a tired team mom and they were like, we're studying for CPA. We're doing this. And I was like, I I'm gonna have to stop y'all here. I cannot get with that one, but for everything else, they were my go-to because they had a they had a different kind of, um, I, I'm, I, the word excuse me, right? But their routines were crazy, but they knew, and here's the thing too. They also know coming from their background, a lot of them are here on visas. There's a right, either I, I have to pass, like there's no other option for them. They did not have options. They didn't feel like there was a, an, another option. It was either succeed or I, I'm going back to my country or my parents are gonna disown me. It was, it was a little intense like that. So when you guys were talking about it and she was experienced like the parents were like, oh, no, he has to do this, that's it. And we're not considering that student's experience and his emotions and feelings. And he's probably just doing things like we said, he's probably just doing what his parents want because that's actually what is very common for them. It's not odd. Right, and from a shutdown place where he's actually not getting a lot of benefit from doing what his parents want because he's so, and that's what, this other coach was so concerned about like how do I handle the parents and handle the student and then also deal with the cultural differences that they they might be hearing her suggestions differently mm -hmm. because she is a white Canadian not from their culture then they might be hearing it from somebody who actually does come from their culture absolutely and, and so you then shared a little bit about how you try and work with parents. And so I don't know if there's a one minute summary <laughs> that you have of when you right. know you're working with parents who are not willing like your father to get out of the way or who don't seem willing, let's say it that way, to get out of the way, how do you, uh, how do you work with them? 
So actually one of the first thing I do, I start asking them questions and then I basically debunk their myths. Mm. And I will, and that has really worked because I would ask, I would say, oh, mom, so I see that you had her applying to all the community colleges. What was your, your thought process for that, right? Like, I kind of already know. And she's like, well, you know, I know it's cheaper. State colleges are easy. She needs to stay here for two years. And I go, really? Because, and then I'm gonna list all the things, like, this is probably why you're hitting this because there's state colleges, they have limited funding, but this school here, she could have gotten A, B, C, D. And then she's just kind of sitting there like, and below, then it becomes, oh, well, you know, I didn't know. I'm not from this country. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And I had someone admit to me saying, I feel a little guilty mm-hmm. because I feel like I pushed my, my, my child here, not knowing that there was all of this over here. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I hear you saying that you work with the parents a lot. Like we learn to work with the students with a lot of questions and listening to hear what's in the heart of the matter and then working best as possible to debunk the myths and they may hear it or they may not. Um, yeah, because it doesn't work on everyone. Because yeah. some I, I've got people that decided not to work with me, no matter what I said. Yeah. They just felt like, you know what? We just really want somebody who has this mindset, like go here. Because I've said, I don't remember it exactly, but I know I've said in one uh, a discovery call, I could tell the parents were just like mm-hmm. on this student. I was like, she doesn't sound like she wants to do this. Yeah. And they decided not to work with me because I kind of made a comment towards, you know allowing her to explore or something like that. And they were like, oh, no, 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 no. We don't even want that. We want her here, here to do this. And yeah. they, you know, they decided not to work with me. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and you're countercultural in that way, right? Like being really steadfastly supportive of the student and also telling the student hard truths when they need to hear hard truths. Absolutely. But it's a fascinating navigation. Well, we need to wrap because in one minute, mm-hmm. all of the Rock Your Coaching people are going to be coming into the room. <laughs> <laughs> for the rock your coaching call so yeah. if people are fascinated to either think about working with you or just follow you you have a great social media presence where can they find you so you can go to my website which is www.candicehudson.com and c-a-n-d-a-c-e and hudson is with a t um you can follow me on instagram candace m hudson um and i'm also on facebook actually i think my facebook says um Candace Hudson, but it says like academic coach. I actually don't remember the exact way I have it on Instagram Facebook. Instagram is great. Good Instagram. Just do the Instagram. <laughs> well, I am just so thrilled to have you um, continuing on with us inside the community to be able to learn alongside you and collaborate with you. So I'm just thrilled you've hung in so long and here we are. And um, I'm going to jump into the call now. <laughs> All right.